Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this, the third annual research day of HJ International Graduate School for Peace and Public Leadership. My name is Stephen Boyd, and I'm the Dean of Enrollment Management and Student Life at uh, HJI. And it's my honor and privilege tonight to be able to welcome you to this event and to thank you for coming. The first order of business is for me to introduce our president, Dr. Thomas G. Walsh. As many of you know, Dr. Walsh is the seventh president of HJ International, and he is a graduate, 1979 graduate of HJI. After his completion of his studies here at uh, our institution, he went on to complete his PhD at Vanderbilt University's School of Religion, where he specialized in the study of religion and ethics. Since his graduation, Dr. Walsh has been a professor at uh, various colleges and universities, and of course here at HJI. Uh, he is just finishing this semester a very interesting course that he was co-teaching with Reverend Damian Dunkley entitled Unification Studies Seminar, Ministry and Public Leadership in America. And it's a course that I wish that I had been able to join this semester. I'm looking forward to the next instance. As many of you know, uh, Dr. Walsh has worked very, very closely with HEI co-founders, Reverend Sun Young Moon and Dr. Hak Jahan Moon in the establishment and in the leadership of the Universal Peace Federation. And until very recently, he served as its international chair. Dr. Walsh is also an editor. Uh, he has edited more than 20 books and publications for the Universal Peace Federation. And he serves now as the executive editor of Dialogue and Alliance an academic journal indexed by the American Theological Library Association. And I know also that Dr. Walsh has plans for another, uh, another magazine, another literary magazine, which probably will become public soon. So uh, coming from HGI. So let's welcome Dr. Thomas Walsh. It's a pleasure to have you here, Dr. Walsh. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dean Boyd, uh, for your magnificent way of uh, producing these programs along with uh, Ms. Buczynski, uh, including tonight's very, very important program, as you said, the third in this series of uh, research day. I applaud Dr. Thomas Ward for his vision and, and grit in keeping this uh, going. And uh, <clears throat> we're very excited about this evening's program and the hard work of our faculty and students who have contributed to it and about which we'll learn more uh, very, very shortly. I just want to say that all of us involved at HGI are thrilled and excited. We uh, know that this institution has a nearly 50 year history and a lot of uh, illustrious and great uh, men and women have made this institution remarkable and extremely significant for the work of our global movement. Uh, when you go around the world and meet leaders, you will invariably find that they are alumni of, of course, UTS, which is now called HDR. We are uh, thrilled that our founder, Dr. Hak Jahan Moon, uh, with particular uh, emphasis became engaged with then UTS and recommended consideration of a shift uh, that uh, would move toward the area of a seminary becoming a graduate school, not a secular graduate school, but a, a, an institution of high learning that would develop even greater capacities to educate students that could impact the world in a variety of spheres and disciplines and with a greater focus on peace, which is kind of the, the way of conceiving our entire global religious and uh, NGO project, how to build the world that God originally uh, hoped for and which was rooted in the principle of creation. So uh, we're grateful for that. We've had the name change. We have developed uh, our peace studies program to uh, go along with our uh, doctor ministry program, master in religious studies and our MDiv program. So 
We have graduation coming up in a couple of weeks. We're looking forward to that. We will honor Ambassador Joe Detrani, a major figure in East Asian affairs and uh, a key player in what has been known as the six party talks of efforts to de denuclearize uh, the Korean Peninsula. So we're ex excited about May 25th and we encourage all of you uh, to consider attending at 43rd Street. I won't go on. I, I know that this evening is really about uh, the uh, research uh, results of uh, all the contestants. And I, I just want to turn it over now to Dr. Thomas uh, J. Ward, our provost here at HJI. Dr. Ward. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Walsh. And Thanks to our judges, to those behind the scenes who've worked on today's program, and also a special thanks to all of you who have joined us tonight. We really appreciate you being here. You know, as an institution, uh, as Dr. Walsh mentioned, we have uh, we refer to ourselves as an institution that's committed to leadership and peace. These are fundamental dimensions of what we try to uh, share it through our, through our various academic programs and. Likewise, our extracurricular and co-curricular programs, but also uh, we are increasingly emphasizing the role of research because research is a means through which we can be able to broaden the conversation, that the conversation not just be amongst ourselves. There's maybe too much of that, and there's a need for outreach with others. We need to understand the language and the rules and regulations whereby one communicates uh, within the academic realm. So we're very, very excited about uh, the work that's being done at HJI and the annual research day is a reflection of that. Uh, and we are um, opening this evening. I'd like to uh, I'd like to call to the floor our lead judge this evening, Dr. James Fleming. Um, I have known uh, Dr. Fleming since 1979, actually. Uh, uh, he came to HJI with me exactly at the time that Dr. Walsh was uh, going on to Vanderbilt at that time. Um, he served as the president of our class. I had the privilege of serving as the vice president of our class with him together. And uh, anyway, he's just an amazing person. But believe it or not, I'm going to share some things about him in, in a minute. But when I knew him, when he first came to HJI, he was the state leader for our church in Florida. That's the Jim Fleming that came to HJI. He was a state leader. He'd been out in the field for a number of years, and uh, he just felt the calling that this was the time to go forward. And he had a strong vision of what he wanted to do. And I think in many ways, he's an example for many of our students, uh, our faculty, and our alums. So I'm going to share my screen. This is, uh, I'd like to share my screen and just say a couple of things about uh, Dr. Fleming. And I think by visualizing it makes it a little bit maybe easier. Um, Dr. Fleming, as I said, he was, a, he, uh, he, he was a state leader when I got to know him the first time, when I first began to get to know him. And uh, he, um, he had uh, done his undergraduate study in astronomy at Penn State University. He earned his master's in meteorology at Colorado State University. Then in 1982, he went on uh, at UTS, uh, HJI. He's a graduate of our divinity program, the three-year program at, at HJI. And uh, then he went on to Colby College, where he served as the Charles A. Dana Professor Emeritus of Science, Technology, and Society. And, and Society. He's been a fellow at the Smithsonian, at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. He's been, he's been a featured speaker at Columbia, Harvard, Princeton, and so many other places. And he's the author of numerous books, uh, in, in, including uh, Fixing the Sky, uh, the, you know, the, the whole history of, of weather and climate change and, and the, the challenges that relate to that. Sorry, Jim, I can't see my full screen here. I apologize. And uh, he's an expert on climate engineering and climate change. He's been published by Johns Hopkins, by Columbia, by MIT Press. And I would say that he's probably 
the most published main mind unificationist scholar in the entire world. I could be wrong, but I'm I'm pretty sure. If you go to Amazon.com, these are all books that are public that that were written by Dr. Dr. Fleming. So uh, you know, and many many academic articles, and these are not all of his books, by the way. There's more than that. But so he has really, I mean, set a very, very high mark. And the important thing is that he's kept his faith. You know, he's a Chunbo couple. He's uh, he he's um, he, he's involved in activities, a great supporter regularly. He's, he supports our, our seminary as a donor every month. He's you know, he's involved with his local church. And in so many ways, he's an example bringing together both all of this incredible contribution that he's that he's made in the area of academics and to his discipline, but also at the same time being really guided by his faith. So it's really a pleasure and an honor for me to welcome you, Dr. Fleming, tonight as our as our uh, opening speaker and also as our lead judge. So thank you very much, Dr. Fleming. Thank you, Tom. Uh, that was uh, over the top, and uh, I deeply appreciate uh, your in introduction. And I cherish our uh, friendship. I'm going to share my screen and give a talk about religion and technology right now, uh, some things I've been thinking about. And um, and yeah, and, and I wanted to add that uh, recently, through a lot of prayer and, and discussion with my spouse, Miyoko, uh, I felt called by God to uh, leave Maine and, and move to Pennsylvania, where I'm at right now. So it was a calling. Um, I want to talk about religion, technology, and the creative spirit. And, uh, geez, I got a lot of little things up on top of my screen. Let's see what I can do. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to talk, I'm going to refer to a book called Flatland, a, rom a romance in many dimensions. And, um, uh, it's a classic science fiction novel. Uh, the second edition came out in 1884 uh, by a scholar and theologian, uh, Edwin A. Abbott. And the, the story is a, a square from Flatland visits Spaceland, and it learns about higher dimensions. Now, in the in the in the Blue Dragon tour, just last week, maybe two weeks ago. Uh, Reverend Dunkley used it as meta a metaphor for uh, higher dimensions of, of faith. And uh, <clears throat> the point that he talked about, the, the, a point visits a kind of a sphere and it doesn't understand what the sphere is all about. So the point in his lecture represented paganism or ignorance, ignorance of God and of the spirit. Then he moved out to a line which would encounter this, the sphere in a, in a different way. And he called that the Old Testament, the age of law. And you see where we're moving on to the New Testament, where the, the, the higher dimension of plane, a flat surface with two dimensions, encountering a three-dimension object would, would consider it to be another plane. But that's the New Testament uh, level understanding of faith. And he went on to uh, the, the encounter of the sphere, the completed Testament age that, that we live in or perhaps just moved out of, the age of attendance. And I wanted to ask a question, like, what's next? What's next in this uh, relationship? Uh, and I, I, I came up with the idea that it's creativity and uh, even aspiring to co-creatorship with the with the divine, and I, I cite the uh, divine principle on origin, division, union, action, and that's quote: when a circular movement of the subject partner and the object partner on a single plane become a spherical movement in a three dimensional orbit, the dynamism and creativity of the universe unfolds. And so it's it's more than three dimensions; it's more than flat land and encountering sphere land. It's a time dimension. It's a development of the three dimensions over time. That makes it a fourth dimensional kind of uh, experience. Now, we've had some other programs with the Higher Purpose Forum and on science and religion. And uh, 
I wanted to just briefly touch on that before I move on to science, or move on to technology and religion. Uh, science is secular knowledge, or understanding derived from experience, study, reflection, experiment, and it's a process, an activity. It's many activities. So science is many things. You could say science is both cosmology and positional astronomy. Science is both bone collecting and uh, theorizing about evolution. Science is a process. It's it's a multi uh, multi dimensional project uh, process. Religion is 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 similar. It refers to particular systems of faith and worship, a, a belief in a higher being a higher purpose, but it's also about behavior. And it too, religion is many things. And we're going to hear that later from one of the poster presenters. Now, historically, and this was the focus of our forum in a couple of weeks ago, the conflict or warfare thesis dominated discussion. And it was mainly about Christianity and religion, not about all religions. The general public sees Galileo affair and Darwinian controversies as paradigmatic with religion resisting or opposing the progress of science. Faith and facts are said to be in heated battle. Religion appears to be in retreat before scientific theories. Another approach is that they're different kinds of magisteria. They're complex systems of, of, of thinking and, and behaving. And they're variously said to be incommensurate, partially overlapping, conflicting, or perhaps unified. And there are also aspects of larger social and cultural practices. What about religion and technology? I'm, I'm, moving, I'm, I'm moving from science to technology for the rest of the lecture. And uh, it ref that ref technology is a term that refers historically to the mechanical arts or the useful arts or the applied sciences. It is a fundamental creative activity of Homo faber, the, 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 the tool, tool building human. In the ninth century, the philosopher John Scotus Erigena introduced the idea that the mechanical arts, windmills, water mills, clocks, metal forges, and plows, our humanity's links with the divine, and their cultivation is a means of salvation. The knowledge being regained through mechanical arts was considered an aspect of mankind's original endowment lost at the fall. And John Scotus was in the uh, in the court of uh, Charles the Bald, uh, Charlemagne's grandson. This sentiment was echoed by Hugh of Saint Victor in the eleventh century. And according to, to St. Victor, this then is what the arts are concerned with. This is what they intend, namely to restore within us the divine likeness. I, th I think that's true of mechanical arts, but that's also true of creative arts. And certainly if you've been to uh, our family ce celebrations, you've seen that in the ballets and the orchestras and the music. But I'm going to talk about the mechanical or practical side. According to uh, Sir Francis Bacon, natural philosophy and technology will improve the human lot in ways that can overcome the hardships of life after the fall of man. For example, Eve's pain in childbirthing relieved by analgesics, or Adam's curse to toil and sweat to clear the ground of thorns and thistles relieved by mechanical devices. Bacon also said the advancement of knowledge will undergird a new optimistic form of society combining Scientia Nova and the Millennium. And so he brought a, a new way of studying nature. Uh, and I, and that, that's all I can say about Bacon right now. There's much, much more behind this. Now, prophecies of the Millennium appear throughout this period. We're still in the 18th century. Uh, Samuel Hopkins, who was a, uh, a New England divine, uh, wrote a treatise on the Millennium. You can find this up on the uh, Happy Trust on the web, 1793. And he was the founder and leading spokesman of the New Divinity Movement, a, a colleague of Jonathan Edwards. And this is a, a snapshot from the page 98 of his treatise. 
I'm not going to read it, but I'm going to highlight the, the idea that about 200 years from now, that is 200 years from 1798, uh, and the millennium is, is scheduled to begin according to his prophecy, that would be 2000 AD. So this is a prophetic American document, which I think has a, a, a lot of interest. It'd be worth your while looking at it. There are other process, prophecies from the, the, or biblical. At the time of the end, many shall run to and fro and knowledge shall increase. And every time somebody invented a different way of transportation or a different way of communication, the prophet, prophecies came out in the, in the uh, published press that this is the, now the end time. And from the Kabbalah in mystical Judaism, uh, the prophecy is that in the 600th year of the sixth millennium, that would be in our Christian calendar, 1840, the gates of wisdom on high and the wellsprings of lower wisdom will be opened. This will prepare the world to enter the seventh millennium or the cosmic Sabbath. So through, the point I'm making is that since the identification of technology as a as a mechanical art that could bring us closer to the divine, there's been a lot, number of prophecies that said, now this is really happening. And it's happening through the uh, Jacquard loom, uh, the steam engine, uh, the telegraph. This was very heady stuff in the middle of the 19th century. And also, it was also a militarized. This is the Gatling gun. So the, the, the inventions were for the benefit of humans, basically, but they were also for the benefit of certain military branches of, of the government. And then Reverend John Blakely. Now, I found this book and I bought it in a rare book sale. And this is uh, the manifestation of deity in the works of art. <laughs> Blakely is very uh, if, if, if effusive. Amidst the revolving wheels of the factory, the sounding hammers of the workshop, the rushing carriages of the railway, and the trembling vibrations of the electric telegraph, the divine presence may be seen and felt as really as when reflected by the sublimest objects of natural scenery. And I'll let you read faster than I could speak, but the, the, the punchline is that the inventor of machinery becomes a fellow worker with God in the physical world, an instrument by which the divine plans for the benefit of the human race are accomplished. The inventor becomes basically a co-creator with God, and God reveals providentially the moment when that invention should be discovered. That's the uh, point of this book. That God didn't give telegraphy to everybody. He gave it to the Brits when they needed to prevail in the uh, in the Crimean War. And, and, and there's an argument established about time and about co-creatorship. And I noticed, I noticed this as I was looking through the images of the time, that there's this kind of uh, inventor, uh, he's probably describing his... Uh, special stove that he invented, but he's using this his finger to sort of point at it. There's a kind of a an inventor and machine uh, intimacy here that's reflective of the uh, of the uh, the Da Vinci the divine spark. So the inventor is the, uh, the the God inspires the inventor and the inventor creates the invention and that's kind of a, a analogous relationship to what we started out with with the uh, sort of the, the cyber spark here in the lower right. Uh, also with, with this, this is again from uh, that book, uh, when the steamship is daily bearing its living freight from shore to shore, when the railway is uniting the most remote places of the largest continents, and when the telegraph is transmitting with lightning speed the messages of business or friendship from distant climes, how can the members of the human family remain in bitter hostility or keep up that feeling of selfish isolation which under a former state of development characterized the human race. So this is going to bring in the millennium. This is post-millennial kind of thinking that the improvements that are coming, the communicating at the speed of light, uh, traveling at you know 20 or 30 miles an hour across the continent, uh, these kind of things, uh, manufacturing, this is going to make the world uh, a proper place for the, um, for the coming of the kingdom. And so technology can be invested with religious significance. Transcendence was to be attained not by withdrawing from the world, 
but by seeking engagement with it, knowledge of it, and ultimate mastery over nature. The vanguard of the movement were the engineers, and they considered themselves these agents of divine restoration and linked their achievements with the recovery of human divinity lost after Adam's fall. This has a very long history. This has many, many examples. They're not just in the realm of religion, but in the realm of engineering, invention, technology. And so there was... Uh, Unlimited popular excitement, especially by the turn of the of the 20th century, enthusiasm for unlimited progress, known as post-millennial technological optimism. That optimism is still with it. It was given. It was dealt a blow by things like the sinking of the Titanic and the uh, World War One hostilities, but this hope springs eternal that there's still going to be an improvement in the world that will allow for the coming kingdom. It's, it's also in the in the divine principle about the roads of Rome and the fact that the, the Roman Empire stretched around the known world. And there's things that are exciting with, through the uh, communications and uh, transportation. Now, this can all go wrong, but, and especially when fallen men play God. And I have God in small, small letters. Uh, Victor Frankenstein is the, sort of the classic example of a scientist gone wrong with incredible ambition, insight, and skill, but lacking in the morality, wisdom, and most importantly, parental love for creation. He didn't love, uh, he swooned and didn't love the creature. He he gave up his responsibility to, to nurture the creature. In, his, in Victor's words, what glory would attend the discovery if I could bestow animation upon lifeless matter and renew life where death had apparently devoted the body to corruption? Modern examples uh, come up in the, uh, again, with mostly with fallen men playing God, seeking God-like powers like omnipotence, om omnipresence, and omniscience. And through their inventions, sometimes it's for the benefit of humanity, but often it's for the profit mo motive, the military motive, or the glory of the inventor. Beyond utility, these technologies of transcendence promise to open a new, hopefully brighter chapter in the history of humanity, all in pursuit of the millennium. And I'll give you some modern examples uh, from space travel. This is uh, mapped onto the desire for transcendence, to leave this earth behind. Richard Nixon declared after Apollo 11's return from the moon, quote, this is the greatest week since the beginning of the world, the creation. Neil Armstrong's biography is called First Man. He's the Adam figure. And space colonists propose settling other planets with an elite core of chosen people, kind of a, a you know a, a chosen uh, exodus. Then there's uh, AI. We were talking about AI earlier. A quest for omniscience, for a, perhaps a perfect language of computer coding, which will restore the Tower of Babel language pre pre uh, that Adam had when the when the whole Earth had one language and few words. AI is a dream of transhumanism to endow a bodily, a bodiless machine with mind. And there's a popular authors that dreams about the brain being downloaded into a computer system, which will allow for eternal life or perhaps enhance memory. Uh, is this a technical advance or a turning point in history? Would this be paradise regained? Or is it culturally destructive and uh, uh, just another way to create deep fakes? Paradise Lost. Uh, I'm, I wanted to share something I found in, in my research. This was Apple's Apple Computer's first logo. It's Newton sitting under the apple and apparently about to get bonked on the head. Kind of an apocryphal image, but that was Apple's first image. Now it's obviously the bite out of the apple, which refers to an earlier uh, book of Genesis. And so... Uh, Another example comes out of genetic engineering, which would be a, a quest for co-creatorship. Uh, it's not a, the Human Genome Project is not a humble science devoted to advancement of the human condition, but in the eyes of its founding director, Francis Collins, it's the most important and the most significant project that humankind has ever mounted. Now, I mean, that's a, that's a proposal for unlimited funding and significance. And uh, he, uh, Collins wrote a book called The Language of God, A Scientist Presents Evidence for Belief. And he was, he was a believing uh, 
Christian and uh, thought that the, the genome was his pathway to, uh, to immortality. Uh, to free humans from the deficiency of their, of their existence after the fall from grace. Perhaps a new eugenics uh, kind of movement. Uh, cloning will also give us as, as much knowledge and power as God. That's uh, it's one of the participants in the Human Genome Project. So in the 20th and 21st century, on this, based on this long history, uh, entrepreneurs have sought transcendence and all the other virtues. But still, the engineers are fallen humans with selfish motivations, working in a fallen world. Uh, with this kind of direction, they can't help but be falling short of godlike powers. And they are playing God with with some of the inventions, but they're not loving the the uh, or being able to control their the inventions. They're too willing to weaponize their inventions. And uh, if technology is not intended to substitute for spirituality, and uh, it's it's in this substitution that the religion of technology can be rightly considered to be a menace rather than a benefit. So. Uh, I think we have to expand our uh, technological history. It can be rewritten based on this kind of perspective that actually is informed by the principle. Uh, and we, we can expand our pantheon of providential central figures beyond the regular cast, including Moses, Jesus, Martin Luther, and John Calvin, and include you know the likes of Francis Bacon, Samuel Hopkins, Thomas Edison, many, many, many others. Now we are using technology right now, including this Zoom meeting. We have digitized scriptures, we have online registration forms, and we have international video celebrations. And I think that's all part of our religion and technology nexus now. But there are definitely abundant opportunities to explore and expand this analysis. I wanna re uh, reference uh, David Noble's book, uh, called the religion of technology, and he gives a lot of these examples about spacefaring and and uh, AI and uh, genetic engineering. It's definitely worth a read if you get a copy of that. Now, this is just like for fun. I'm wrapping this up. Uh, people like uh, Ray Kurzweil and popular authors talk about the singularity, and so the singularity is either coming real soon or it's already here. Maybe. Uh, what we experienced with the chat GPT was a political singularity where uh, it, it's taking its own uh, initiatives. But the, the, the term singularity has come to mean the distinction between humans and machines disappears. And we can become kind of, kind of a new meaning for sort of becoming one with the machine or perhaps a new apocalypse in which humanity becomes uh, irrelevant. And so I, I, I found a cartoon that says, well, the end is near the end is near, where science and religion finally agree through the Bible and through the scientific uh, apocalypse. Now, I'm going to end right there with um, religion, technology, and the creative spirit. And I want to emphasize that what what the message was, especially from Blue Dragon, was be principled, be faithful, attend true parents, and also be creative. So thank you for your attention. And uh, we'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Fleming. And and I, uh, one second, excuse me. Um, I apologize. Um, yeah, that was an excellent presentation. I really felt that uh, you you did what all of us have to do. Basically, um, you've taken all of the study and all the investment that you've made over all these years, and you're showing very clearly the ways in which uh, it sheds light upon the principle and our ability to share and bring uh, bring the principle to others. It's just remarkable, I think, your, your work. And uh, I also... Um, I'm reminded of St. Paul. I mean, basically, St. Paul had, came with a specific skill set, and somehow he took that skill set based on the foundation of Christianity uh, and brought everything to a new level. 
and Christianity became something that people who had not paid much attention to until then could be able to really grasp and appreciate. So I really appreciate your pioneering work. It's amazing. And uh, um, we have to get you back to speak more <laughs> time. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Last year, I tried to convince Dr. Fleming to teach a class. Maybe at some point he'll get inspired. We'll, we'll see. Maybe that Pennsylvania spirit will will move you, Dr. Fleming. We'll see. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so uh, I wanted to <clears throat> just share some general thoughts with everybody as well concerning the whole history of the uh, of research day and what this is about and why why we are doing it. And uh, uh, really, uh, Dr. Fleming's presentation, I think, set the tone about why we need to engage more in research. So um, why research day? Well, one reason why we want to engage in research day is because it is part and parcel of our mission statement. Uh, the um, international, the, the uh, HJI International Graduate School, our mission statement emphasizes that we are a home of thought. This is a place where thought is meant to, to, uh, to be generated. As I said, of course, this is also the place where we want to deepen our relationship with God, our understanding of true parents, the relationship between true parents' message and, and, our, and, uh, and our lives and our, and our leadership. But also there's this dimension of being a home of thought. And uh, a home of thought, you know, is what, HJI has been throughout its history. HJI is where unification theology developed. It's where unification history developed. It's where world scripture developed. It's where uh, Professor Lay, you know, a, a lot of of the of the work with with VOC teaching was brought to a different level. Um, it's where uh, unification uh, thought also was was brought to it to a different level. It, it's it's a place also where. True family values, a way to dialogue more effectively with Christians. And um, there's so much more in addition. Uh, very many, many, many works that have developed through HJI scholarship that have had important implications. So we are a home of thought, and research day, I think, helps us to hone our hone our skills in that area. Now you might ask, well, why posters, you know? You know, when I when I first attended a research day for the first time, I thought posters. I mean, and and I I I I thought about back in being an elementary school student. You know, when you you do these nice posters, and your mom would help you with them, and you'd hope that that you'd win a prize. But within HJI, the poster really is the place where we kind of articulate what we are researching and why we are researching, what we're trying to do. We have a research question, you know, um, and uh, we we in order to seek an answer to that particular question that we're raising, we use certain types of methodology. Uh, obviously, that 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 may involve that that may involve interviewing um, people that are that are that have been affected by a certain situation. Obviously, it, it involves uh a research of the literature, a whole variety of steps that we take in terms of our methodology to get to the point where we can actually begin to develop some findings and building upon that, then we want to go forward based on that and, and propose next steps. Research never stops. It just continues on and on from that, that particular point. That's the exciting thing about it. It's something organic, something that is with us and something that, that continues. So each and every one of the posters that we, we see, they, they reflect that type of an effort. I want to thank each of our judges tonight. I want to thank, um, uh, obviously, Dr. Fleming, who I've already had the chance to introduce, who really sets a very high bar for all of us in terms of research. And um, also Professor William Lay, who served for many years as Professor of Criminal Justice and Human Security at the University of Bridgeport, and also uh, was a director of the School of Public and International Affairs there, who was a Kent scholar. If you know anything about Kent scholar, it's a pretty high level of scholarship at Columbia Law School, who was a senior editor of the Columbia Law Review, who clerked on the New York State Court of Appeals, um, which is equivalent to the Supreme Court on the, on the federal level, and who has served as a judge for many years at Columbia Law School's annual mock trials. 
and has been published in a variety of venues, including East Asia, Harvard Asia Quarterly, E-International Relations, Columbia Law Review, and is a very serious scholar. And, and I, I didn't mention there, but he also, uh, he, he was trained as a chemist. He did his undergraduate study in chemistry, and uh, he worked under a Nobel, a Nobel Prize uh, winner of, in chemistry, um, Dr. Brown, Herbert Brown, I believe, right? Is that correct, Dr. Professor Leia? Herbert C. Brown. So, uh, you know, he has this combination of, of, of science and social science and humanities all wrapped together. And um, Professor Lynn Walsh also, she's a graduate of the University of California, Santa Barbara. She has graduate credentials from HJI and from Fordham, where she specialized in social work. Um, she has been the director of the Universal Peace Federation's Office of the Family, and she represents UPF at the UN. She served on the executive committee of the NGO Committee on the Family, and she served two terms as co-chair of that uh, UN NGO Committee. And, and uh, early in her career, she served as a family therapist at Fair Oaks Psychiatric Hospital in New Jersey, and she's been a couples counselor for, the, for, for our, our own church movement. She's been published uh, in uh, Family Capital and in uh, also in um, Family Futures. And she's been likewise featured in a number of UPF uh, international publications as well. And uh, yeah, she's, she's very serious in her work and really has done remarkable things in terms of her efforts at the UN and really making a very strong effort to reach out and hopefully we want to get more of our students working with you as we go forward, Professor Walsh. And uh, Dr. Walsh, I don't know how many of you know that one secret is that he did his undergraduate study at, at Western Kentucky where he played basketball. And he was a member, he was a starting member of the team of the Western Kentucky basketball team that made it to the final four. So, you know, um, that's a secret. I, I was very surprised by that, but that's kind of where he comes from. You can imagine the kind of training and grit that one has to go through to get there. He's an HDI graduate. He has a PhD in ethics from Vanderbilt University. He began his academic career as a full-time faculty member at Iowa State University. And as, as you already heard from Dean Boyd, he's also taught part-time at many of the universities in the New York area. And uh, until he began his work with the International Cultural Foundation and with UPF, where he served as the international chair uh, from basically 2006 until 2023. He's traveled in more than 120 countries and he's met scores of heads of state and worked with them in some very delicate circumstances. He's published numerous academic articles. Uh, refereed articles, by the way, not, uh, not he, he's done a number of refereed articles, and he has also edited more than 20 books with the University Peace Federation, and he serves as the executive editor of the Dialogue and Alliance. So I'd like to thank each of our judges tonight. We're really grateful to have you with us, and we know that you really, I, I can say as a witness, they really took all of this to heart in terms of really paying absolute their best attention to each and every one of the submissions for this year's research day. I'd like to also thank all of our behind the scene key players, people such as um, Dean Uta Delaney and Assistant Dean Thomas Delaney and Dean Boyd, who work so hard to help people to be able to submit things properly. And it's not easy to do it, to get everything into Canvas properly. And they spend a lot of time making that happen. happen. And Angelica Businski, who's been so involved with so much of the of the of the communications, and Ken Sohn, who's been behind everything in terms of IC, uh, IT, and Karen Matthew, also uh, our faculty secretary, who has been encouraging our faculty and students through Popoli to be a part of this year's event. And we we have a lot more contestants th this year, and I think it's because of the efforts of all of all of these people and all, all of all of all of you who've made a decision to be part of this. I'd like to say something now, just very briefly. I'm sorry I don't have time to go into a lot of depth, but I'd like to just pay tribute to each of this year's uh, submissions, you know. And I would encourage all of you, if you go to the HJI homepage, and at the bottom there it says view submissions, if you if you click on that, you can be able to take, you can be able to look at any one of the submissions from tonight. If you want to see James Edgley's uh, presentation on rage and race and providence just you can click there and you can go right in and you can be able to see it 
And I'm sure that all of the scholars that worked on this will be happy to communicate with you. So our student submissions, uh, Chris Kennedy did a submission on absolute values and unificationism. Uh, Mary Moriarty spoke about um, understanding the original dominion. Uh, Abel Martinson has a paper talking about reforming uh, the United Nations Security Council, very well thought out. Uh, Rahim uh, Mishahi, he's Iranian, but he lives in the Philippines. His, uh, his paper talks about the whole matter of disinformation, communist information in the case of Iran, where he's from originally, although he now lives in the Philippines. Um, Koshin Young, who did a very interesting project relating to animal rights through the lens of unification thought. Um, yeah, Christine, uh, she did a, her, her paper deals with, I'm sorry, I can't see the screen, I, but uh, her, her, pa her paper deals with the issue of Israel-Palestine. Very thoughtful piece, very well done. And uh, Giorgio Gasparoni, a piece on a, on a, on a, an analysis of the Serbia, Bosnia, and uh, Herzegovina disputes in the Western Balkan context. Um, Thomas Krasinski, he talks about going forward in, in the case of Cyprus, a, a country which has been divided for decades between a Turkish partition and a Greek partition. Um, Uri Lida, one of the earliest members of the Unification Church in Czechoslovakia, who speaks about the whole process and the endurance and the things that our members went through in those early years uh, in Czechoslovakia. I'm, I, Christine's last name is Fukui. I'm sorry, I can't see the name. I couldn't see your name, Christine. I apologize. James Edgerly, uh, Race and Provenance in America. Very thoughtful piece, something that he's spent a lot of time working on. Um, sorry. Uh, I'm sorry, my, my screen moved forward quicker than that. Uh, Lydia Carforo, her, her, her piece is on analyzing the current Ethiopian war. Um, Sen Ang talks about the, the impact of uh, managing plastic bags and, and, and if not, the consequences of that, which it has upon environment. And he asks questions related to environmental applied ethics. Um, Athanasius Francis C. Catalan speaks about the, the dream of uh, the Bering Strait Peace King Tunnel and Bridge and uh, his thoughts on that particular project. Sofal Cham Rowan speaking about the Rohingya conflict in, in Myanmar and trying to find a way to go forward with that particular conflict. Uh, and anyways, each of these each of these work students have done a lot of work. And uh, most of these projects that you see, they have not just submitted a poster, but they're working on an article or they are um, or they are making efforts. Mary Marshall Moriarty, for example, has already been published by a peer reviewed journal with some of her work. So our, our students are not just doing posters, they are writing, uh, they're, they're writing articles and the hope is that those things are gonna be published and get out into the world. Uh, faculty submissions also, um, just want everyone to recognize the hard work of our faculty who takes publication very seriously and who spend a lot of time with research on, on a regular basis. Dr. Drissacone, for example, he's really, um, He's done incredible work in terms of his research and efforts in Africa and analysis of, of civil war in Africa and in the Middle East. And uh, he teaches some remarkable courses based upon those experiences. He travels regularly to Africa. So his, his, uh, his writing, his work, his projects are informed by all of those efforts. Uh, and likewise, uh, Dr. Kesuke Noda, who uh, has done a great deal of work, uh, particularly with Viktor Frankl, and um, talking about the, the whole the whole process communication within within and amongst religious uh, communities, and this is something also that Dr. Noda spent a, a great deal of time in, and very, very significant work, um, and also has been published in that area. I should I should mention, as has Dr. Kone been published. Uh, Henry Christopher. Um, this is this is his sincere reflection on the historical conditions of war repeated in the quest for world peace. He looks at, he looks at the past. He looks at the Cold War. He asks questions related to the Cold War and sees how that applies to today. Uh, and then we also have some submissions by by faculty. These are non-competitive 
submissions because those submitting these are judges, so it might be difficult for them <laughs> to be objective. But very excellent pieces. I mean, I would really encourage you to see Dr. Walsh's piece on HJI going forward. This is a man with a vision, uh, really some incredible perspectives on where HJ has, has to go and and how to do it. And so I'd really encourage you to uh, to look at Dr. Walsh's work. And I think, Dr. Walsh, I hope that some of these presentations, maybe we can make the, the soundtrack available even on our web website so people can see them and learn more about them because they are very, very important. Uh, this is this is a very important one, actually. <laughs> uh, this is a, a piece that, that uh, relates basically to the com comfort woman controversy and particularly the situation of, of Taiwan where there is a deep partisan divide and the two different focuses on human rights, which cause there to be an impasse in relationship to this particular issue in the case of Taiwan. And uh, yeah, Professor Lynn Walsh, uh, you know, as I said, she's done so much work at the United Nations that relates uh, to, um, to the family, to the preservation of the family, to population and development. And uh, yeah, she's she's regularly there. You know, I go down to New York, I visit the office, and many times uh, she may come through the office, but really she's very, very often spending time at the UN with the work that she's doing down there, which is very, very significant in terms of really defending the family. There's a lot of confusion at the United Nations concerning the status of the family, the role of the family. And yet, if you, if you look at the... Um, the De United Nations De Universal Declaration of Human Rights, framed within that that uh, that that document, is a call for the protection of the natural family. So she's doing some very important work and building important alliances. And uh, yeah, th so this so this really reflects her work. So as I said once again, uh, I'd encourage all of you to take a look at these particular uh, posters. I'd also encourage um, students and faculty. Uh, to think about next year already in, in terms of what type of work or research that you would like to do. Uh, and uh, I think that this is something that uh, really is an important piece in terms of all of our work at, uh, at HTI. And I'm so grateful that uh, Dr. Walsh is such a strong supporter of the need to be able to, uh, to have our faculty and our students engage in academic discourse beyond just our own community. And so that's that's extremely important, and it's a blessing. And I think it's 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 part of what Dr. Walsh has done for so many years because of his work with UPF, and he's bringing that broader dialogue with him now as at, at HJI. So um, that said, I'd like to turn everything back to the judges and thank each of you again, Dr. Fleming, Dr. Walsh, Professor Walsh, and Professor Lay, for all the time that you've spent in this this spent. In helping with this during the past uh, during this this particular competition, so thank you and God bless you. And the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Dr. Ward. Uh, representing the judges, we're going to give the awards now. Uh, the faculty awards come first, and uh, I've been asked to do that. And it's a real honor to award Dr. Kiske Noda first place prize in the faculty research category for his stimulating, thought-provoking, and immensely useful contribution. Title is Hermeneutics as an Open Dialogical Platform for Competing Final Vocabularies of Religious Communities. Inspired by the work of philosophers Richard Rorty and Martin Heidegger and the psycholo psychologist and Holocaust survivor Viktor Frankl, Dr. Noda's work has opened a path beyond confrontation and conflict to dialogue, sharing, mutual respect, and acceptance between and among adherents of competing belief systems. This approach that we might call ensemble ethics by analogy to ensemble weather forecasting with a number of atmospheric models can provide indications of areas of convergence of values and the range of remaining differences this has immense significance for the hopes of all unificationists for universal salvation and reconciliation of world religions and ethical systems. Congratulations, Dr. Kiske Noda.
Congratulations. Gambate <laughs> uh, it's, uh Now, that's great. So another round of applause. So it, it's it's my further privilege to award Dr. Drisse Kona a certificate of honorable mention for his contribution titled Toward a Unification Ther Theory of Peace and Conflict. Dr. Kona's survey of conflict resolution thought and its relevance to unification thought is both practical and personally transformative. The certificate of honorable mention is provided by the Alpha Nu Pi chapter, the HJI chapter of Theta Alpha Kappa, the nation's National Theological and Religious Studies Honor Society. So this will be a certificate for your contribution. Congratulations, Dr. Trisse Kona. So that's the faculty category, the winners, all winners. And uh, now on to the student awards to be presented by Drs. Thomas and Lynn Walsh. Well, thank, thank you, Dr. Fleming. Uh, and uh, <laughs> following the pattern that you just pioneered, we have a winner uh, to announce, and we also have a group of honorable mentions, uh, in, in fact, five. Uh, as Dr. Ward indicated, this has been a spectacular outpouring of creativity and hard work and in their research and uh, quite inspiring for all of us as faculty members and uh, officials of the institution to see this. I'm happy to announce that our student winner is none other than Giorgio Gasparoni. Uh, Mr. Gasparoni, his topic was the complex analysis of Serbia and Bosnia-Herzegovina disputes in the Western Balkan context. Now, Mr. Gasparoni lives in uh, Italy or San Marino in particular. He is uh, very familiar with this area of tension in the Balkans and the former Yugoslavia in particular, which after the breakup of the Soviet Union in 1989, 90 in the Reagan-Gorbachev-Bush uh, era, this uh, region uh, kind of uh, broke apart from Yugoslavia into a number of ethnically related states and uh, there was a resolution in the 90s that Mr. Uh, Gasproni uh, goes through and points to current challenges uh, being uh, faced in that region. And I can't go into it in depth, but I know two things more closely about Mr. Gasproni is that he has worked closely with the Poderitsa Club which uh, started uh, in Montenegro, Podorica is the capital city, and uh, the uh, former president, I believe, Vujanovic, uh, who I met a few years ago in New York at the UN, uh, was instrumental in, in helping found the Podorica Club, and the UPF has worked in partnership with them. And as Giorgio knows, uh, Alfred Moisu, the former president of Albania, and others, even the former president of uh, Serbia, uh, Tadic. Uh, so it's uh, his work uh, was really, uh, it jumped out at me. And I think uh, for us as judges, as a very, very important contribution and a hopeful uh, pointing toward uh, some resolution that has, so it's great background in uh, the context and in the issues and in the literature has done the hard work of research, but they can also find a way on that foundation to link it to what uh, his own work and the work of our wider 
movement uh, reflected in this case through UPF can contribute to that uh, process. So in closing, I'll, I'll just say uh, once again, a round of applause for Giorgio and also as the publisher of Voices of Peace, which is a fantastic journal that he's been producing and writing for for a number of years. Um, thank you, Giorgio uh, Gasparoni. Now we have five uh, honorable mentions and really I, we could give honorable mention to everyone, but uh, we, we did make a, a cutoff. We went through every uh, poster and video carefully. <laughs> And uh, my wife, Professor Lynn Walsh, uh, who I'm happy to say teaches here also at HJI, uh, will introduce uh, the first uh, honorable mention. So there, there was an ordering because we had to calculate the votes and the, the five that will appear consecutively now, Lynn will introduce two, then I will come and introduce two, and then she will conclude with the fifth honorable mention and just say at the outset that as uh, Dr. Fleming indicated, these honorable mention uh, contestants will also receive the certificate from Alpha Nu Pi, the chapter of Theta Alpha Kappa, which represents theological and religious studies as an honor society. Uh, so I turn it over to you, Lynn, uh, to announce our first runner-up. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, well, as you mentioned, our first runner-up is uh, Chris Kennedy. I just want to mention this whole uh, process of reading and studying the videos and the post post posters has really elevated my value of uh, HJI as a real thought school uh, home of thought um and uh each every single one of them was really uh uh quite inspiring uh so keep it up everybody uh also i want to say how hard it was it reminded me of uh the olympics swimming contest swimming uh you know when the judges are looking at 0 0.0012 or something like that so it it wasn't easy but uh each one of you really need to be commended. Okay, so I'm going to make a few comments on uh, Chris Kennedy's uh, really amazing uh, presentation. Uh, I really feel, you know, in this world, it's drowning with relativism. And, and it, it was so refreshing, uh, uh, Chris, to hear you tackle the notion of absolute values, really articulated in an in-depth exploration of unificationism. Um, yes, our understanding of God, the original, the origin of absolute principles makes all the difference. Uh, without it, we are in a downward spiral in terms of widespread rejection of absolute and universal values. Even the ideal of human rights, long considered to be a basis of a global consensus about human needs, is under threat. We see the rise of nationalistic ideologies and all kinds of identity groups professing their own realities and rights, uh, creating wider and wider political pol polarization. I've seen this especially um, in the area of family and sexual integrity, um, as mentioned at the UN, but we see it all over where um Traditional consensus has been exploded into this blizzard of uh, different alternative lifestyles. So, uh, Chris, I was especially partic uh, particularly appreciative of your emphasis that a key to fostering social process progress was by strengthening the natural family, because this is the core of God's creation and therefore the core of social co cohesion. Um, I also appreciated how you uh, emphasize how unificationism brings rationality together with spirituality and calls for science to work in complementarity with a value-centered worldview. Uh, such good points. Um, so this research is sorely needed. Um, 
There needs to be uh, some restoration of reasonableness that avoids extremes of absolutism and skepticism rel or relativism. So we appreciate the value of reason or rationality on the one hand and spirituality and human value on the other. So you did an excellent job. This line of research has potential to make significant impact of the world. Congratulations and please keep it up. Thank you, Chris. Okay, next I have the uh, honor and well, challenge I said of, of uh, commenting on the uh, articulate presentation of Mr. Jim Edgerly. So you're the second second honorable honorable mention awardee. Um, I just found a very helpful analysis of what you see as the five causal factors to so the social breakdown, culture disarray, polarization we see uh, rampant today. <clears throat> you know, what is the pre what are the present age situation and and what are the causes? Um, so you suggested. Uh, each of these, um, five of them, and that each needs to be addressed to move providentially out of this trouble, troubling time. So it's such an important work you've done and investment. Um, you pointed to the first and foremost factor as the dramatic decline in religion, and along with that, the loss of social cohesion and social norms. Um, and again, we see, and you mentioned the rampant breakdown of fundamental unit of the family, and this destroys the most basic social fabric. The second point you made was you referred to it as the universalizing of rights, uh, this expansion of, of claims to rights, which you know has created a great deal of polarization. Again, I witnessed this at the UN, where there is a significant powerful promotion of children's sexual rights, which of course contradicts directly parental rights. Um, then you pointed to the whole destructivist activism, which is clearly, as you said, up uprooted the values and beliefs of our country that has under underpinned what hold us together for the last 400 years. <clears throat> Um, and then a fourth point was um, the deep and widening divide between the very few rich and the many poor. Um, this suspects its young people, uh, especially as they see this great injustice and it's hard to move up in society. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, this needs to be addressed. Um, <clears throat> finally, you pointed to um, a failure of future, which you called a uh, revitalization of our culture through new light. Um, and uh, again, I think, yeah, we need a, a spiritual, a cultural awakening. And, uh, you know, new leadership <clears throat> is needed in this area. But I think we all have to say, yes, HJI, unificationism, is a, 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 certainly a source of this hope, you know, for a spiritual and cultural awakening, um, as is evident by this poster contest. So, Chris, uh, I mean, Jim, we really appreciate and recognize all your investor investment in higher purpose forum. Um, you know, you're aggressively going after this. <clears throat> um, it's broad, comprehensive uh, vision is really needed. So thank you for your adventurous thinking and keen analysis of the factors that must be addressed for provid God's providence to advance for all of us. So thank you and congratulations. All right, back to you. All right, thank you, well done. Uh, Dean Boyd, I hope we're okay. I know we're a little over time. I'll, I'll try to uh, move a little more quickly. We're uh, doing just fine, Dr. Walsh. Okay, our, our next, uh, Honorable mention uh, is none other than Thomas uh, Krasinski. Uh, I, I should say, you know, there were many times, but one way of seeing different personalities at play in these were some that were a little more focused on very specific areas and kind of honed in, and others that have this very broad and expansive, comprehensive uh, 
<clears throat> perspective and they're drawing us into that wider world and they're both so important and so valuable but uh this particular one just as uh the one by uh, Giorgio is, is kind of focused in this case on the conflict uh, in Cyprus uh, between a divide, still a divided com country, almost like a, a Korean Peninsula situation with uh, uh, the, the northern part of the country uh, kind of occupied by Turkey and uh, the southern part is uh, associated with, with Greek and Greek Greek Cypriots and Turkey Cypriots. And he has used the methodology of the U.S. Institute of Peace to analyze this problem. It, uh, it, is, it remains unresolved. He talks about uh, the joint decision trap that uh, afflicts the EU's ability to effectively uh, address the problem, I think of you know the problems we have at the UN or with the with the Security Council, but uh, the the requirement of unanimous decisions has an impact. And this term, joint decision trap, um, he is calling for more uh, uh, engagement with non governmental organizations, with youth, and with women, and calls the UN to focus not only on its peacekeeping focus, but also uh, ramp up the peace building initiative, something that I think he associates with the uh, when Kofi Annan was the secretary general. But just another very uh, ar well articulated uh, uh, presentation of a, a crisis that brings a, a lot of uh, deep wisdom and insight to to that uh, that issue. So uh, uh, Thomas uh, Krasinski, uh, congratulations, as uh, honorable mention, uh, for your imp important work and great uh, presentation. We're, we're proud of you. Uh, and uh, my uh, last one before Lynn wraps up this list of five is Dr. Tomasini, who's a medical doctor from uh, Venezuela and uh, she has taken on, you know, this broad area of thinking about the the whole uh, scientific worldview, emphasis on the Darwinian worldview, and uh, how this worldview is so one-sided, more materialistic and atheistic. She's drawing on uh, various thinkers who have uh, called us to consider the anthropic principle. I know she refers to the work of Stephen Meyer, who's from the uh, uh, Discovery Institute and, and many other authors that she's well versed in and, you know, seeking to open up this way to a kind of a, a uh, uh, cooperation uh, between science and religion. So uh, very, very uh, significant work, kudos to, Dr. Tomasini for her ambitious, and she has the foundation to do it. Here she is a medical doctor trained, and she is uh, now studying in a school of theology and peace studies. So uh, she's going to have this broad foundation to do a great work in the future. And, and I, I just I'll conclude my little thing. You know, what's exciting is to see among all these students and faculty uh the hope to fill a desperate need in our world to make impact and get the world on a great footing i think that's the vision of our founders without any question and to see that starting to take hold and see the the hope that we can build on the great accomplishments already achieved and move even further forward so thank you and congratulations to Dr. Tomasini, for your great work. Then you have the last. Uh... Yeah. Okay. So uh, the last honorable mention awardee is uh, Uri Lida. Uh, uh, Uri, I am, uh, it was such a deeply moving um, and profound piece you did. And it's so important to um, re mind us of um, what it's like 
in uh, just regular people as the uh, real death grip of communism takes over your country. I mean, um, so I'm so happy you uh, undertook this project to preserve the memory of these real saints and to understand and honor their work and their faith. Um, you know, today we see so many that are naive and blind about the horrible reality of Marxism. And uh, it's proven to be, you know, so disastrous to humanity. So how can we forget this history? Well, you are reminding us in a very important way. Um, and in the area of cancellation, where too many lacked courage to speak up, we need to connect to these real lives. We need to think about their value, their amazing faith. That was the key, their amazing faith of these are our brothers and sisters um, who stood up against really the most evil, uh, powerful uh, invasion. Um, so we really need to pause and think about the depth of faith of these people. Um, you know, and the real living relationship of God to make these decisions to stand up. And uh, brother, you're right. I know also you did not mention it, but I know that you yourself was in prison, I think, for two years and, uh, you know, a miserable situation that you also endured. So, you know, you've been there and uh, lived your faith and your your courage. And uh, thank you. So um, thank you again for reminding us of the people that perhaps are like ourselves, but risk everything to stand up for God. And uh, we need to hear these stories of these heroes. Uh, heroes. Um, and thank you so much for doing so. Well done. Beautifully done. Thank you. And now I turn it to Professor Bill Lay. <laughs> Thank you, Lynn. Uh, wow, uh, what an evening it has been. Uh, <laughs> and I hope that, you know, all of us who have maybe not had a chance to go through the papers and the videos, you'll you'll take the opportunity, you know, your appetite is whetted. And, uh, you know, I do echo the thoughts that, you know, when I spent basically a day uh, or a half a day going through everything, it was so uplifting for me. Uh, it was such a good, uh, inspired, my wife was wondering, what are you all inspired about? You know, and well, I spent the whole afternoon <laughs> reviewing everyone's submission and it, it, they're great. And it reminds me of what a worldwide community we are, what a home of thought we are, how interconnected we are throughout the world. It's very beautiful. Now, I do want to say a little bit in commendation of our three non-competitive entries. Uh, that was Dr. Ward, Dr. Walsh and Professor Walsh. Uh, they were really special. Please have a look at them, okay? Uh, Dr. Ward, it, you know, who in, in many ways is sort of the impetus behind Research Day, um, he gives a perfect illustration of how to combine research and outreach. And, uh, you know, his work in Taiwan, his, his, his involvement with many different groups, particularly, I was happy that he spoke at uh, Columbia Law School, my law school, he was, you know, representing HJI on the panel there and uh, having an opportunity to interact with wonderful people and establish a network. It's a great model for what we can do. Uh, Dr. Walsh, when you review his presentation, you'll see that he's thinking about the future of seminaries. He's thinking about the future of small institutions. He's, he's very much thinking about the future of HJI you know, what we are, what is our mission, how we can advance it, I think is really worth listening to and appreciating. Uh, and finally, Professor Walsh, uh, her topic was the, um, you know, the low birth rate issue in a number of countries. Uh, that, by the way, was a front page story in the Wall Street Journal today. It's a very hot topic. And, uh, and, and I was so inspired uh, that she uh, was able to, you know, get the cooperation of the Hungarian mission to the United Nations to, to put on a conference at the UN. Again, what a wonderful model of the type of things we can be doing. And the Hungarian mission, of course, Hungary is, uh, I learned from Dr. Walsh, is dealing with a very low birth rate and bringing it up through various programs. And uh, they said, let's do this every year. 
So I mean, isn't this great? This is this is a, an aspiration that we can all you know meld our efforts into these kind of things. So thanks to our uh, non-competitive contributors and really to our the, the heart and soul of our HJI, and thanks to everybody participating in this activity. And I'll turn this back over to Dr. Ward to kind of wrap us up. Thank you very much, Professor Lay. And uh, thank you likewise to uh, Dr. Walsh, Professor Walsh, and uh, to uh, Dr. Fleming. Um, you know, I'm reminded this evening about the original purpose for which True Father and True Mother created HJI. And the original purpose really was because he absolutely felt there was a need to reach out to Christianity and through Christianity to build a bridge to the world. So um, I really feel that what we have gone through this evening is a very important exercise. Those of you who have taken the time to put together your these these marvelous presentations, I. Uh, it's wonderful that they could be reviewed by um, scholars that have lots of experience reaching out beyond our community and learning how to communicate. So this is a very important exchange. And it's really, I think, one of the fine tuning dimensions of HJI that uh, this exercise, as well as many other exercises, internships and other, other uh, co-curricular activities, are key to making each one of us more effective in terms of what all of what we're doing. So I thank our judges. They spent a lot of time, you know, as you as you heard from Professor Lay. They didn't just watch all the videos. They didn't just read all the all of all of the posters, but they also met amongst themselves several times to decide how are we going to do this, how are we going to proceed, how are we going to make decisions. This was it. Really, kind of. <laughs> We interrupted their entire week, you know, kind of to be able to do this. And really, we owe a debt of gratitude to them. And we owe a debt of gratitude to each and every one of you who took the time to uh, to to put together a poster. I thank uh, I thank our faculty. I congratulate Dr. Noda and Dr. Kone. I thank our students. I um I congratulate uh, Giorgio and James Edgeley and Chris Kennedy and Tomas and Maria Gabriela and your, uh, Dr. Lida. And I thank uh, every single one of our participants who joined us tonight. Thank you for encouraging uh, our students in research and likewise reinforcing the mission of HJI. God bless you all. And a, a closing note, I'd like to invite up now uh, Dean Stephen Boyd, who's played such a key role in terms of getting everything together for all of us. So. Uh, Dean Boyd, I thank you for all of your work for HJI and for all of your effort to to attract such uh, wonderful students, who the fruit of whose work we see tonight. So let's well welcome up uh, uh, Dean Stephen Boyd, the Dean of Enrollment Management, to close our evening. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Ward, Dr. Walsh, Dr. Fleming, Professor Lay, Professor Walsh. Um, I'm almost without words. You kind of took the, my thoughts just now. I'm a student at HJI, I'm in the Doctor of Ministry program, and uh, I'm also the Dean of Enrollment Management. So my job is to try to bring people to this institution. And really the testimony is that it's God that's bringing everyone to this institution, it's true parents that are bringing everyone to this institution. But when, when, we, when we're talking to our unifications community, many times both first and second generation will say, well, wait a minute. Why should I go? To, why should I go to HDI? You know, well, I mean, I, I got other things going on and whatnot. Well, part of the answer, I think, is you've seen it tonight. This is why we have this institution, and I, I, we have some great minds on our faculty. We have some great minds in our student body, but some of the students, I, I, I don't know this for a fact, but I would wager one dollar. I would wager one dollar, Doctor Walsh that many of the students, some of them who got a one or honorable mention, didn't think that they would be doing this now, that they would have this kind of ability or be that this be, be drawn out of them by HJI. Uh, and I think if True Mother were here tonight and she were watching this, she would be 
immensely proud of the efforts. Because like what Dr. Ward is saying, this institution was founded, as Dr. Walsh said, almost 50 years ago for a providential purpose. And that purpose is to train and educate and equip current and future leaders to dialogue with the outside, the rest of the world community, be it Christianity, be it political leaders, be it civil leaders and civil servants, whatever. Uh, this is the function of this institution. And tonight, I think we saw with the great variety of topics that were covered, which came out of the hearts of the students, they weren't assigned topics, but came out of them, what God put on their heart to, to study about and to research on the wide variety, the great wide impact that our graduates can and are making in the world today. So uh, if you're thinking, you may have not have thought about coming to HJI, but I invite you to meditate on this and uh, apply. I dropped my contact information into the chat. If you want to look through there quickly, you'll see the chat with a couple of links of interest uh, and an, a link to apply. But if you just have a question, please write me at my email address. It's in the chat. I'll be happy to help you as well as the rest of our staff. So, Dr. Walsh, I'm sorry for speaking a little bit longer than was on the program, but it's from my heart. And thank you all for coming.